This episode is sponsored by our friends at YCharts. Graphs and charts have long been the common language between advisors and their clients, but not all visual communication tools are created equal. With YCharts, each output is a powerful visual that brings your analyses to life and intuitively explains the why behind your strategy. Go beyond a simple price chart and educate clients about the levers that truly impact performance or risk and emphasize your most important insights with flexible chart annotations. Plus, custom branding, colors, and disclosures position you to fully own those insights. Go to YCharts.com to start your free trial. My name is Michael Guyatt, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. I'm going to be there with Mark Zandi, who I know a lot of you have seen over the years doing the media runs. But Mark, introduce yourself for those who are not familiar with you. Who are you? What's your background? How did you get involved interested in economics and markets? And what are you doing currently? Well, my day job, I'm the chief economist of the Moody's, the Moody's Analytics. And I became part of Moody's about 16, 17 years ago. I had a consulting firm that I started in 1990 and I sold it to Moody's. So I've been with them ever since. And so I run the research group. We've got a couple hundred economists all over the world doing all kinds of different things. And just for sake of disclosure, I'm on the board of directors of MGIC. They're the nation's largest private mortgage insurer. I'm the head of the risk committee there and on a couple of nonprofit boards as well. So that's me in a nutshell. I got my PhD in economics from Penn, University of Pennsylvania. I grew up outside of this, the city of Philadelphia in the suburbs. I still am there. My kids joke that I've been sheltering in place all my life. I am pretty close to Villanova if you're a college basketball fan. And I went undergrad there as well in the, in the Wharton School of Business. So that's me in a nutshell, Michael. Okay. A lot of things I want to ask you. I shared at the top of the space here, this tweet you put out in response to Fitch's downgrade of treasury debt, this idea that it's nonsense. Yes, treasuries are still the pristine asset, at least in theory. Some people will vastly disagree with that and say Fitch didn't do enough. Just lay out some of your thoughts on what we've seen in the last, you know, whatever, 12 or hours when it comes to not just credit rating agencies, but also the response by the bond market. Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's a non-event. I don't think the pitch downgrade has any particular impact or meaning on markets. I don't think they're imparting any new news to global investors. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, global investors understand that the U.S. Treasury debt is money good, that, you know, you invest in a bond, treasury bond to get your principal interest back in a timely way. It's the way it's been since the nation's founding, and you know, no reason to expect that to change. And you know, it's a bit odd. I mean, you know, Fitch and other rating agencies do have, and you should know, I'm not in the Moody's rating agency, so I'm outside the rating agency, just for sake of disclosure. And uh, you know, AAA, you can buy Australian debt; it's AAA according to Fitch. You can buy Danish debt, AAA. You can buy Eurozone debt. Triple A, you can buy Singapore debt, Swiss debt, triple, but you know, push comes to shove, something goes wrong in the global economy. Something even just goes wrong here, capital comes flowing here because people, you know, investors know, global investors know that the US Treasury bond is the triple triple A credit on the planet. So I, I don't think there's, you know, much meaning to the downgrade or any meaning whatsoever to the downgrade. Right. And what you're referring to there there is that like to safety dynamic, right? When there's whiff of a tail event, right? You tend to see money kind of crowd into treasuries. Obviously, it wasn't the case last year. You had it momentarily during the regional bank crisis in March, and then it's unclear what happens next. I'm curious, do you think just the whole idea of having a reading on a country that has the reserve currency, is, it, is that just nonsense to begin with because we just print currency and who cares about the debt? No, limit? I think debt matters. I'm not saying that. And I do think our long-term fiscal situation if we don't make any changes to policy, the spending and tax policy is unsustainable. I mean, the arithmetic is, I think, compelling. If you just look at the Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, the nonpartisan folks that you know look at the budget carefully. So I wouldn't argue that. I think we do need to you know put the economy, the, the fiscal situation on a more sustainable path. But I think you know we will. Like we always have. You know, we've had again since the nation's founding. Lots of challenges, and we've always risen to the occasion. I don't see any reason why that has changed. So I don't think we can just to wash our hands of the fiscal problems that we have and say, oh, this is no big deal with reserve currency. I think it will un ultimately undermine the willingness and ability of investors to come here if we're not prudent and careful. 
So we need to be that. But I think we're a long way from, you know, undermining that reserves currency status or the fact that we are AAA in the minds of investors. And when things aren't going as to script, you know, and it doesn't even be a, need to be a tail event. It's just things aren't going to script. They're, you know, we're in recession. Money comes flowing here. And even today, I mean, the U.S. dollar is, which is a kind of a barometer of that, is strong. I mean, it's not as strong as it was, you know, back maybe six, 12 months ago when the Fed started jacking up interest rates before a lot of other central banks in the developed world. You know, it's very strong by any kind of historical standard. So, you know, money still is flowing into the U.S. Is there any sort of mechanical dynamic that happens when there's a downgrade like this that causes some for selling by larger players just by mandate? I don't think so. I, not that I know of. You know, maybe some global investors, you know, in their fiduciary relationship with their clients, you know, have some terms where the sovereign debt or any debt is downgraded to a certain level that you can see some selling. But in the case of sovereign debt, U.S. sovereign debt, I'd be surprised, but I don't know for sure, Michael. Yeah, it's just, I mean, that to me is always sort of the interesting dynamic of just market structure, yeah. right? If some prices, right, based on a particular reading, does it create sort of a, you know, a domino effect. Okay, so so remains to be seen, as I recall in 2011, it was S&P that did the downgrade, but I recall it was, there's was another reading agency, I think that, that kind of said it first, maybe I'm wrong on that. But it doesn't sound to me like you think that there's maybe a repeat of the turmoil that we saw in 2011, where when S&P did that downgrade, you know, oddly enough, treasury yields actually fell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. As you had the kind of flight to safety trade back then. No, I don't see any prospect of that. I mean, as you point out, back in 2011, in the wake of that debt limit drama, after lawmakers had come to terms and increased the limit, S&P did downgrade and the markets, the equity market, which was already pretty fragile, you know, prior to that, because of the debt limit dra- drama, went down further. And I think, it, you know, peaked to trough in that period, equity prices were probably down close to 20%. So, but I don't see any of that happening here. I mean, the fundamentals of the economy are just too good. And yeah, I just, I don't think the, you know, the Fitch rating is going to, you know, mean that much to investors in the grand scheme of things. Okay. So let's talk about that point about fundamentals being, you know, too good. And, and just for the sake of discussion or, you know, back and forth on this, how much of that is too good aspect related to the lagged effect of lower rates, right? Because I do think that, this is my own view, there's maybe an underestimation of the impact and delays of the fastest rate hike cycle in history on the economy. The long and variable lags have yet to, I'd argue, really hit. I think there's some of that for sure. And I think there are some risks posed by the continued fallout from the rate environment. I mean, one thing that does make me nervous is that it's likely the Federal Reserve is going to keep the foot on the brakes here for quite some time, at least well into next year. The yield curve is going to remain inverted, you know, throughout that period. And that does put, creates a very difficult operating environment for banks and for the financial system more broadly. And, you know, there are other things going on in the system that are going to add to the pressures, that that tough operating environment. Credit quality will start to weaken. I mean, credit quality has been excellent. And even if it normalizes, that'll put some additional pressure. For some more regulatory costs, loan growth is slower because of a tightening down in underwriting standards related to the banking crisis that hit back in March. So, you know, I do think the financial system is under pressure and there's risk there. So if I had put my finger on the thing that would undermine, you know, the economy, undermine my optimism about the economy, that would be it. So I do agree with you. I concur with you that we haven't, you know, fully seen the fallout from a very dramatic increase in interest rates, short-term interest rates that have occurred, particularly that have occurred, you know, over the past more more than a year. But But having said that, I think the economy has digested the right hikes to date gracefully. I mean, amazingly gracefully. I mean, consumers are hanging tough. They're doing their part. You know, they're they're fortunate because they've locked in the previously low interest rates through refinancing waves. By my calculation, only about a tenth of the household debt outstanding from cards to mortgages adjusts with market rates, at least within, within one year. So they're relatively insulated. They got plenty of cash, you know, particularly high income households, middle income households. And that's where the bulk of the spending occurs. And so they're, you know, they're not spending with abandon. They're not out, you know, hair on fire spending, but they're spending 2% real consumer spending growth, rock solid on the nose for, you know, the last 12, 18 months. So it feels pretty good there. And then, you know, I can go on, but I'll just mention one other thing that, you know, I think adds to the economy's resilience and ability to digest the higher rates you know, so far gracefully is 
fact that businesses just do not want to lay off workers. You know, they're adjusting now to the higher rates and the weakening in demand by pulling back on their hiring. You can see that in yesterday's report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the job opening labor turnover survey. But they're not, the layoffs are still well below kind of, you know, historical norms. There, there was a bit of a pickup late last year, early this with the tech layoffs, but they've come to an end. And so layoff rates are, you know, well below what you see, histor- see historically. And I think that does just go simply to the idea that businesses know that their number one problem through thick and thin, and this was even before the pandemic, clearly in the pandemic and post-pandemic and in the, near, in the foreseeable future, is finding a qualified workers and retaining them. The demographics here are pretty compelling on the front. And uh, so they're looking through whatever it is going on now. The other thing, I think they, the business is helping condition businesses' response to all this is they're hearing recession, but they're also hearing short recession, mild recession. So they're thinking, oh, okay, well, I can weather, you know, a storm, an economic storm in the last six, nine months. And, you know, you know uh, I'm willing to live with that because I know, again, on the other side of whatever it is that we're going to suffer here or experience, it's going to be, you know, labor problems. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold on to my labor. And if you don't have layoffs, I think that's hard to get a recession. I think layoffs are the key to recession because they're the thing that spook consumers, cause consumers to pack it in, run for the bunker, stop spending. And at the end of the day, you know, that's what you need to get a recession. If consumers keep spending, a recession is just not going to happen. So that, that lock-in effect is one that's, you know, well-documented. You can argue that's why those higher rates have really impacted the way that maybe traditional models would argue, right, as far as the economic side of things. It seems to me that if you're going to be negative or bearish, the area to point to would be credit card rates, right? It's the revolving credit that maybe breaks consumer spending. Any sort of interesting trend reversals or things that you're seeing when it comes to consumers and how they are viewing credit card interest rates? Because again, I go back to if everybody, if the effect of higher rate isn't there as much as it used to be because of the lock-in, you have to do more on the revolving side. Credit card seems to be the obvious place where the heavy lifting has to be done for the bears. Yeah, that's right. I mean, of that, I said the, the 10% of household debt liabilities, which cl- includes cards, consumer finance, you know, buy now, pay later, auto, student loan, mortgage, first and second, only 10% of that, maybe a little bit more than that, is going to adjust with the shift in market rates, at least over a year. You know, if you extend out a couple, three years, then you'll start to see some adjustment. So it's very modest. I mean, the bank card is only a trillion dollars outstanding. And it's, you know, back to where, if you look at the trend lines and the growth in bank card outstanding prior to the pandemic and just extend that out through time, the outstandings today, the trillion dollars is exactly where you'd expect it to be. You know, it fell very sharply during the teeth of the pandemic. Real, people really pulled back on credit card use, and it's, but it's bounced back. But now we're just kind of where we were you know, on trend with pre-pandemic trends, it's not that big a deal. You know, it's not big enough to, you know, really weigh too heavily on consumers in the aggregate. Now, I'm, you know, obviously painting with a broad brush here and there are distinctions between the kind of the finances and the, the balance sheets of high-income households, middle-income households, and lower-income households. And kind of think of it in thirds. That's an easy way of doing it. Thirds of the income distribution. Top third, their balance sheet is as strong, arguably, as it's ever been, you know. Lot, lots of wealth, no debt, locked in. Do they have any debt? You know, they're fine. Middle income households, they're okay. You know, it's not quite as good, but it's pretty darn good. And it really is the bottom third where there's more financial stress. And that's where the credit card and consumer finance, you know, borrowing has been mo- most significant and more of an issue and will weigh on and is weighing on those consumers' ability to spend. But again, there are, you know, and, it, and I don't mean to be, I'm mean, looking at this from a kind of an academic perspective, not thinking about, you know, what all this means for, you know, low-income households, which is considerable. But from that kind of that academic perspective, you know, green eye shade, no emotion perspective, they account for a very small share of spending. Here's a good rule of thumb, and it's only a rule of thumb, but it's, I think it's very helpful. Two-thirds of the spending, consumer spending occurs by folks that are in the top third of the income. Folks in the bottom third account for maybe 10% of spending. So, it, you know, it's not, it, the, account, the economy can't flourish, you know, with the situation, but it, you know, it can continue to move forward and avoid an economic downturn. And the other thing I'd point out is that we are starting now at this point to see some slowing in the growth in credit card 
outstanding than receivables. That goes to largely to a tightening up of underwriting standards by by lenders. You know, they they kind of let loose back in twenty one twenty two, where there was a lot of score inflation that you know, that led it to the very strong growth in out receivables we've seen over the past year or year and a half. But in response to an erosion in credit conditions, quality they have tightened up, and of course the banking crisis you know reinforces that tightening. So we are starting to see a real substantive slowing in outstanding growth. And I think it you know, probably suggests that this will become even less of an issue, you know, 6, 12, 18 months down the road. I know you want to talk about fair value across different asset classes. And I think it's an interesting discussion because fair is in the eye of the asset holder yeah. in general. But first of all, just from an economic perspective, explain what that term of fair value even means. It's thrown around a lot. I don't know if people really understand, you know, what it means in practice. Yeah. And you should know, I'm as, a, as an economist, you know, I'm a macro guy, you know, I'm looking at the world from 30,000 foot. And I, I really don't spend a lot of time on asset prices, except when they feel like they're, and appear to be quantitatively, and I'll explain that in a minute, what that means, high relative to fair, significantly higher than fair value or significantly lower than fair value. Because then you can see, excuse me, big movements in asset prices up or down one way or the other. And that does have macroeconomic consequence. So, but barring those kinds of periods when asset prices are, you know, within spinning distance of their kind of fair value historical norms, you know, I'm not paying a whole lot of attention to it. It's not that big a deal. You know, I would say that fair value in, it is really kind of the simplest way of thinking about it is the discounted value of the stream of earnings produced by that asset. So in the case of stocks, you take corporate earnings, you have a forecast of its of the growth in those earnings, you discount that back by using an interest rate. Obviously, when rates rise, that discount rate rises and the value of that future stream declines. Then conversely, when rates fall, that re- increases the value of that stream of you know, fr- future earnings. But that gives you a kind of a, a fair value. And, you know, so that's for stocks, you know, for, for a, a rental property, you know, for an apartment building, you would, you know, do this, you count, you'd have some expectations for the rent growth for those apartments, some discount rate, you discount it back and that give you a sense of, you know, what the fair value of that, that, that rental property is. So that, that's kind of sort of how I think about it. And we use that intuition in our modeling to estimate what fair value is. And when prices, asset prices deviate, again, meaningfully from you know, that fair value, that equilibrium value, then, you know, then I start paying really close attention because again, that makes it means that that asset is vulnerable to either falling significantly in price or rising significantly in price. And if that happens, that can have all kinds of macroeconomic consequence. You know, it could be directly through the change in wealth. You know, the stock wealth effect is, you know, well documented in terms of its impact on those high income households I mentioned earlier, because there are such big share of overall spending. Can have effects on the decision at the asset prices, particularly real estate values, can have big impacts on financial institutions because they're the ones that are providing the debt that supports those assets. And if the price falls, then you know they're more, more likely to suffer default delinquency, undermines their capital, and you know undermines their ability to extend out credit. You can also you know shifts in asset values can affect the people's sentiment and confidence and. That in, has impacts on, you know, the macro economy. So there's a number of different channels through which asset prices can affect the economy. But again, I think those effects are generally small in more typical times. It, and it's when asset values really deviate that, you know, I really pay attention and call it out, you know, take account of that in my expectations for where the economy is at. Which is further away from your perspectives from figure value, stocks, bonds, or stocks, bonds. And I'll tell you why I'm saying it that way. You have two different stock markets this year. You've got large caps you know, being the winner and you've got small caps, the relative basis being the loser. You've got treasuries and then you've, again, you know, saying yield curve inversion and recession that's coming. And then you've got credit spread saying that's not true. So the disconnect, I'm saying, which is more of a stock bonds or stocks bonds. Is it fair to say that we're kind of in a weird environment where the co-movement of of things is really unusual compared to history in terms of that valuation thought process? Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in financial markets. And we can talk about those things and try to square them. I mean, I, I have a thesis as to what's going on, you know, with respect to some of the things you mentioned in terms of credit spreads and 
shape of the yield curve and, you know, what's going on with bond yields. But to ask your, you know, original question about, you know, which is, you know, more out of sync, you know, where's valuation more of an issue? Is it stocks or bonds? I'd say it's stocks. I mean, in my mind, bonds, and then when I say bonds, for, let's, for the moment, think about the 10-year treasury bond, you know, because that's the kind of the new Marer. That feels at 4%-ish, you know, feels like it's at fair value to me. I mean, you know, that's what our models would say. I mean, just motivate it with a little bit of intuition, you know, in the long run, in the long run for an economist means, you know, abstracting from the vagaries of the business cycle and sentiment and, you know, momentum and all the other things that affect markets. In the long run, the 10-year treasury yield, the nominal 10-year treasury yield, which is at 4%, should be equal to the nominal potential growth rate of the economy. You know, that's nominal GDP. And that's about 4%. You know, 4% is nominal is 2% real GDP growth. That's the economy's real potential growth. And we talk about what that means. And 2% inflation target. So in the long run, we are going to see 4% nominal GDP growth. We're, we're above that now, obviously, because of the high inflation. But that's where we're going to settle in the long run. And that's where the 10-year treasury yield. The 10-year treasury yield kind of sort of like the economy's cost of capital. The nominal GDP growth is kind of like the return on capital in economy wide, they should be roughly equal to each other. By the way, you know, if you assume a simple, you know, spread of 150 basis points with the federal fund rate target, and that's kind of been the long run, again, abstracting the vagaries of the business cycle spread between the 10 year and the funds rate, it should be about 1.5 percentage points, 150 bips. So that means if I'm at 4% on the 10-year and that's equilibrium, that's, you know, fair value, then the fair value equilibrium, all economists call R star, should be about 2.5%. And, and that's exactly where, you know, the Fed would say it is if you look at, you know, their forecasts of long-run federal funds rate. Right so that feels fair value to me. Feels like we're, you know, right roughly where we should be. Now, obviously, when you start looking at corporate bonds and asset-backed securities and, you know, CLOs. I mean, there's all kinds of nuance and each market has its own dynamics and, you know, may have, some may be overvalued and some may be undervalued. And, you know, right now, you mentioned the corporate bond market and maybe there's some overvaluation there. Spreads feel very thin, you know, to me. So maybe on the margin, some overvaluation. But I, yeah, you know, I, I digress. Equity market feels somewhat overvalued to me, not because of interest rates. Again, I said they're pretty close to fair value. Remember going back to, you know, how do I, you know, calculate fair value? So, you know, the expectations of future corporate or with the equity market is a stream of future earnings discounted back. So the discount rate feels about right, you know, 4%, maybe a little low if you're going to use a corporate bond yield. But, you know, the corporate expectations of corporate earnings, that feels a little strong to me, you know, compared to what I would expect given that 4% nominal GDP growth I'm anticipating, you know, in the long run. And so, you know, I think the market is on the high, what I would say is on the high side of fair value. And I think that would be, you know, everything I've been saying is kind of roughly consistent with, you know, the idea of looking at like PE multiples, you know, PE multiples, price earnings multiples, kind of another way of looking at like what I've been saying you know, are on the high side of their historical norms. You know, there's, you know, I think on the S&P, you know, these data better than I, but on the S&P is probably closer to 20, you know, depending on how you measure it. In the long run, it's probably, should be, you know, probably closer to 15. So that, you know, that's not screaming to me overvalued, but it's saying, hey, you know, the market does feel a little bit overdone here and, you know, maybe a potential risk of suffering some kind of pullback, near-term pullback, and, uh, you know, gas some macroeconomic consequence as a result. I wonder to speak about those discounts. I wonder how much of the disconnect between large caps and small caps can be attributed to sort of the fear of, you know, in quote to zombie companies being unable to survive rolling over their debt into the higher rates. Because, you know, there's a lot more companies, obviously, that are smaller caps that are going to be more levered than, you know, multinational large caps. Am I off on this idea that if you're going to look at the equity landscape, if something is in quotes overvalued or undervalued relative to fair value, that small caps might be the most at risk of surprise because of their own sensitivity to rates? Yeah, I, yeah, that could be. You know, the, if you look at corporate debt, you know, we've been focused on household debt. If you look at corporate debt, it's, you know, in aggregate, it doesn't look like it's a deal. It's a problem. But that's always a mistake, you know, to just to look at the averages and the medians and the means, the middle of the distribution. That, by the way, is a mistake I made with regard to the banking crisis. You know, if you look at, you know, the averages of, the conditions in the banking system, you say, oh, you know, the system is fine. It's, but you got to look at the distribution and, 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 you know, look at what's going on with individual banks. And if you, if I had done that, 
I think I would have been much more alarmed by what was going on, you know, with like an SVB, for example. Same kind of thing in the corporate debt market, I think. You have to look at the distribution and it feels more barbell to me, you know, meaning you've got large companies that are really no debt. I mean, if they got debt, it's because it was free money. You know, they back, you know, a year and a half ago, no reason not, you know, take on that debt, particularly if it's long-term debt. And then you have on the other side of distribution, corporate businesses that are highly levered, you know, really levered up. Mostly, I think, you know, levered up by private equity firms, you know, that have been looking to juice up their, you know, their, their equity returns. And that's where I think there's some vulnerability. You know, it hasn't been a big deal up till now because of the maturity structure of that debt, it hasn't really come due, but it will. And this, this goes back to something I said earlier, you know, the thing that worries me about the financial system is if, if rates stay where they are, if the Fed has to keep its foot on the brake for a long time and the yield curve inverted, you know, one reason to be nervous about what that means is these companies that are highly levered are going to have to refinance in that environment. And if they do, they will find that, you know, they're not going to find, the terms are going to be very different. They, they can get the debt at all, much higher rates, much more onerous terms. And that's when you start to see the, you know, defaults and delinquencies and, and defaults and more, probably more significant macroeconomic issues. Now, now having said that, you know, I'm not overly concerned. It's not my base case. It's not, you know, this, the, I'm still relatively sanguine about the economic outlook in part because I do look at, you know, the corporate you know, bond spreads and corporate inve bond investors who are, you know, spending to do this for a living and looking at it, they're saying no problem. They, right, at least so far, now I can change pretty quickly. We'll see. But at least so far, you know, no big deal. I mean, I look at, for example, the high yield yield index, the ICE index, option adjusted relative to the 10 year yield, again, the numeraire. And the spread, I think the last I looked was well below 400 basis points, maybe 380, 370, something like that. Long run historical norm is 500 basis points. And you don't really get into a place where you really get nervous and recession is going to happen unless it's above 750 basis points. So right now, the corporate bond market is saying, you know, Mark, relax. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I am nervous about it. It makes me, you know, queasy, particularly if the Fed has to keep its foot on the brakes for a long time here and the curve remains inverted for a long time. But for the time being, I think, you know, we're okay. You know, it's not existential to these comp to these companies or to the, by extension, to the broader economy. Historically, which is a, which leads which? Is it that the yield curve leads or is it that credit spreads lead? The reason I'm asking that is there, there's a very tight relationship between credit spread widening and volatility and the VIX, right? So option justice spreads rise, VIX spikes, you know, because it's kind of a repricing of default risk. And a lot of people reference credit spreads as a leading indicator. You know, bonds lead stocks. But is it credit spreads that lead or is it the yield curve that leads? They both lead. I think the yield curve is a long lead and the the credits, the corporate credit spreads are, are more of a short lead, maybe three, six month lead. The bond, the treasury yield curve, depending on how you measure it, kind of my favorite is the 10 year versus the funds rate leads by 12 to 18 months, you know, something like that, which by the way, would suggest because it, the 10 year Fed funds inverted back, I think October, November last year that, you know, if we're going to have a recession, if you, you know, you take a literal interpretation of the yield curve, a recession late this year going into next, which is if you look at most economists forecasts and who have recessions in their forecasts, that's when it's going to occur. Like Fitch, you know, one of the reasons they downgraded was they said the next three years aren't going to be any, are going to be tough on the fiscal outlook. And one reason for that is we're going into recession. So they have a recession starting in the fourth quarter, which would be consistent with, you know, that inversion of the yield curves. Now, I do think the yield curve is a historically been a, you know, obviously a very good predictor of recession. Primarily, I think the channel through which it, it works is through the financial system, the banking system. The, and it goes to many of the things we've been talking about. I mean, it goes to the net interest margins of financial institutions that, you know, most fundamentally, you know, financial institutions about what they call maturity transformation, meaning you borrow short at a low rate, you lend long at a higher rate, and you play that positive yield curve. If the yield curve inverts, that becomes a lot more difficult to do. You can do it, you may, you know, you'll be okay for a while because you can hedge, you can match. And, you know, I think banks have done a pretty good job of doing it, SVB being, you know, an exception. Go take a look at JP Morgan's you know, net interest margin in the last quarter, it was, you know, I don't know, 280, 290 basis points. 
pretty much what it was the quarter before. So they're able to kind of match and hedge and you know, keep it together despite the inverted curve. But if you go back historically, banks and other institutions didn't do that or were unable to do that or weren't, you know, weren't thinking about it in those terms, the net interest margin would collapse with the yield curve. They couldn't make any money. You know, their profitability would erode. And then that's they pull back on credit. And once that happens, the economy goes into a recession, particularly if that happens after a period of very rapid credit growth, because all those folks that went out and borrowed in the good times when the curve was positively sloped, you know, they, those businesses and households, they need to come back and they need to refinance and they come back and refinance in an inverted yield curve environment where banks aren't lending, then boom, that you, that's the problem we were just talking about. And, you know, but you got delinquencies, then you get the fault. Your businesses have to make some hard choices, a Hobson's choice. Do I make my debt payment or do I cut my payrolls and investment? You know, they do both and the economy goes into recession. That hasn't happened this go around. And one of the big differences between now and other periods in history, when the curve was very useful as a predictor, is banks have gotten pretty good at batching and hedging. You know, they have really managed this pretty well so far. And they, you know, the credit has tightened, but not to the degree that it would cause you know, a recession. The other thing is we didn't have that very rapid credit growth, you know, back a year or two or three, four years ago, because, you know, one, the financial wake of the financial crisis, people were much more prudent in their borrowing and also because of the pandemic. So we never really got going. The credit growth really not got sent out. So we're not seeing as much debt coming due, you know, right now. Again, if the curve stays inverted, if the Fed continues to have to keep its foot on the brakes for an extended period and you know, we have this conversation a year from now and the federal funds rate target's still five and a quarter to five and a half and the yield curve is still, you know, inverted as significantly as it is, then I think we're going to have more of a problem and recession risk will start to rise again. But, you know, the curve is a very good predictor. Historically, I don't think it's at nearly as good in this go around, although it's, you know, I, I wouldn't discount it. It's still, there's still, you know, a, a sobering message in, in the inverted curve. We need to get inflation back down. We need to get the Fed taking its foot off the brakes, and we need to get that curve, you know, rightly sloped again before, you know, these bad things start to happen. So reset the room for the remaining minutes here. Everybody, please make sure you follow Mark Zandi on X or Twitter. I guess I have to start calling it X. And if any of you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be a podcast under Lead Lag Live. You, you had said the phrase, if they can get the debt at all. And I feel like that's a good transition to housing and in particular commercial real estate come back to that fair value point. I've had a few people on these spaces before argue that office real estate in particular probably is done. It's kind of factored in all the bad news it possibly could. And if you're going to actually take a contrarian bet, you'd actually probably want to bet on the office side of things. Where are we in, in the cycle for commercial real estate and these concerns that that's sort of a real headwind going forward? Well, I think from a macroeconomic perspective, what it means for the economy, there's still more fallout to come. I mean, you're right. I think investors have done a pretty good job. Real estate investors have done a pretty good job of, you know, discounting the future for particularly office to a lesser degree retail. I think there's good reasons to be more sanguine about the industrial warehouse market. Maybe it's mostly the multifamily market with some exceptions. But it's really about the office market into a secondary degree, the retail market, particularly in those downtown areas where the office, people aren't going back to offices. So, but from a macroeconomic perspective, there's still, you know, more to come. We're going to, you know, see some pretty substantive declines in construction. You know, interestingly enough, so far at least, construction, office construction is, hasn't rolled over. It's still, you know, quite strong, but that'll happen at some point here and we'll you know, see some impact from that. I'm sure we're going to see more defaults and delinquency. And, you know, I wouldn't be at all shocked if we do see some small banks fail that they you know, ultimately choke on their CRE lending. I mean, here's an interesting statistic. The, if you add up all the CRE exposure, and I know this because I was doing this yesterday, if you add up all the CRE exposure, and that would include loans and commercial mortgage-backed securities, CMBS, that banks large banks have, and large banks are, I'm using the Federal Reserve data, and large banks defines top 25 banks. So I think that's every bank with more than 150 billion in assets, let's say. Their share of assets that are in CRE is 7%, you know, maybe 8%. They went through CCAR, that's the stress test scenario that they have to, the Fed requires them to take every year. 
And that, in that scenario, CRE prices in aggregate fall 40% peak to trough. So, you know, that's a pretty draconian, scary, a very highly unlikely scenario, but that they capitalize that. So I don't see any issues there. But for the smaller guys, if, you know, if you look at their CRE exposure, you know, as measured by CRE plus CMBS divided by their assets, it's close to a third of their assets. And small me, again, it banks below 150 billion in assets. And that's most of the banks. So if you told me that, you know, we're going to see some small bank failures because of CRE, because of office exposure, retail exposure in particular, maybe multifamily in the case here or there, I wouldn't argue with you. I'd say that sounds about right. Now, most times, and I think the most reasonable scenario is no big deal. These aren't big banks. They're not systemically important. They're not going to be a problem in any sense. But, you know, we live in a kind of a weird time. You know, you saw what happened back in March when, you know, some small banks, I mean, even SVB was pretty small. I mean, 200 billion, it wasn't considered SIFI. They go belly up and that drew, uh, created a deposit run. And of course, you know, put us to the brink and required a pretty aggressive response by the Fed and other regulators in the treasury. So, you know, it does feel like depositors are on edge. They can move their money fast because of online banking. Social media plays a role. You know, people are getting used to thinking about money markets and that's, you know, a very serious competitor to banks on deposits. So, you know, we see a few bank, small bank failures and that could reignite that bank run and that would be a problem. You know, that, yeah, unclear how the Federal Reserve and others would respond to that. And that's, you know, fodder for, you know, a, a darker scenario. So I think CRE, you know, the most likely scenario is it's digestible. It's not going to be any fun. It's going to be weight on growth, but it's not going to do us in. But, you know, as you can see, I can pretty quickly construct a, you know, a darker scenario, but it, it runs through the financial system, you know, the small banks. Talk about housing for a minute here. So I, I was pretty loud the last year and a half saying that I think housing's in major trouble. I use more colorful language. And that based on the behavior of lumber, because I have research, which nobody can dispute, which shows that historically lumber is a leading indicator of risk on, risk off sentiment because of the link to housing. And I get it. There were disruptions because of COVID, which maybe made the signal not as effective as it could have been, or it could have just been randomness in terms of it not being consistent with the message of home builders, unclear. But uh, have you been surprised by this, in quotes, housing reacceleration and how much of this reacceleration is a knock-on effect of the wealth effect of rising stocks, which I think is an interesting theory to kind of think through? Yeah, I've been surprised. I mean, if you go back a year ago when prices were peaking, you know, we do explicit house price forecasts and we had house prices falling, peak to trough, almost 10%. And, you know, it looked like it was moving in that direction late last year and you know, mortgage rates. 30-year fix got up close to 7%. And, you know, by our repeat sales index, we calculate our own repeat sales indices for markets. Nationwide, that was down 2 3% from the peak. It looked like we were on track. And then, you know, we saw some easing in rates. The 30-year fix got down to closer to 6 And that restarted demand. I mean, people, you know, came back and the price declines have abated since then. So, you know, since the peak, June, July of last year, prices nationwide are basically flat, zero. So I've been surprised by the resilience. Now, I'm not surprised by, you know, kind of why it's happening. I just didn't expect it to happen to the degree that it has. And that's the, what you mentioned, the lock-in effect. You know, the average coupon on an outstanding residential single-family mortgage is about 3.5%-ish, you know, something like that. So, you know, people are saying, hey, you know, I, you know even if I hate my home, I love my mortgage is the, the saying, you know, I'm not going to sell my home with the three and a half percent mortgage, go out and buy another one and get a mortgage at seven, the doubling in the mortgage rate. And, you know, that's, that's just, I'm just not going to do that if I don't have to. And I think that's what's really played the most significant role in keeping the market, you know, up. You, know, you're, you make, you know, the equity market may, may be a, playing a role a bit, maybe on the margin, but the price strength is Across the board, you know, it's all parts of the housing market, the low end of the market in particular. And that's, I think, less likely to be impacted by, you know, equity, effects of equity prices, the wealth effects on housing demand. Now, having said all that, I still expect some price declines here. Again, going back to fair value, I think housing prices are, house prices nationwide are meaningfully overvalued, you know, probably, you know, 10 to 15% at this point. 
you know, and I think what happens is it's a kind of a slow grind down that those people who've been locked in, you know, eventually they're going to have to sell, right? Life happens. You know, people die, people get divorced, people have children, you know, all those millennials that, you know, bought, they're going to have families and they're going to want to move out to the suburbs, you know, to raise those families. So in job change, I mean, people are going to want to move. And as that happens, as, you know, people, and they can put off those, the move for a while, but after a certain point in time, they can't. And I think, you know, we're getting to that point and we're going to see life drive more sales, you know, more inventory, more sales, and we'll see prices move lower. Because at the end of the day, the market is overvalued. In other words, saying that it is unaffordable. People can't afford homes at these mortgage rates and at these house prices with the incomes that they have. And I do think going forward, we're going to see, I think mortgage rates will come down a little bit from here. So hopefully when the yield curve, you know, gets rightly shaped, more rightly shaped. And as you pointed out, you know, that allows the kind of the spread to narrow again, the mortgage spread to narrow again, going back to, you know, issues around prepayment. I do think mortgage rates will come in. I do think incomes will continue to rise. As, as I said, I don't think we're going to suffer a recession, but I do think we also s- still need to see some house price decline. So right now in our forecast, Peak trough, we have house prices declining, I think it's five, six, seven percent peak to trough, not 10. So you've scaled that back, but you know, still see some price declines, which means some parts of the country that'll be, you know, double digit. We will see some double digit price declines, which, you know, poses a bit of a threat. But finally, I'll say there again, I'm relatively saying when it comes to what it means for the macro economy, because there's a lot of equity that was built up when prices soared. I mean, okay, suppose prices fall 10%. You know, from the peak last summer to the trough, they'll still be up 30% from where they were before the pandemic started. That's nationwide. And, you know, that's a lot of equity. And that, you know, that provides a lot of cushion for, you know, delinquency and default and, you know, makes it less likely that even with those kind of house price declines, we see a significant macroeconomic. Yeah, I think, I mean, as I hear you, I think there's two dynamics, to this, right? One is, okay, so even if mortgage rates come back down, it goes back to, you know, is there availability for that to begin with, right? In terms of just credit flow, which I think is an interesting to think through, an interesting thing to think through. But uh, I do also think there's maybe almost a psychological element to this. I mean, you hear these stories about brokers, mortgage brokers basically saying, listen, you know, it's okay to lock in the high rate because rates are going to go lower, right? They're using the narrative that they can always refinance. Yeah. People are used to the idea that, you know, rates will probably come back down because that's what we're conditioned to think for the last decade plus. I suspect it almost has to be sort of a a collective realization that that's not going to come back again, that maybe suddenly stops net demand, or at least lessens it quite a bit. Right, it, it, and that'll happen over time. I mean, right now, that a broker can say that and people say, okay, that makes sense to me. But what about six months from now or a year from now, if we're still looking at a six and a half, seven percent, 30 year fix, you know, will people start to change their expectations and that will be the basis for them. One more reason for them to start, you know, moving, particularly given if they had a, you know, a divorce or a job change or, you know, a new kid or whatever it is. Let's go to some of the audience and my friend, who's also a great follow here. Go ahead. I think long-term rates, and again, when I say that I'm using the 10-year treasury as kind of the benchmark, I think they're roughly where they need to be long run. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think 4%-ish is roughly the nominal potential growth rate of the economy, nominal GDP growth. And that's where they should be. So I, you know, they'll go up, they'll go down given the business cycle and capital flows and you know, momentum play. So it's a market. So, you know, it's not going to stay at four, but I think in the long run, cutting through up all those ups and downs, it will be about 4%. So I think we're roughly, you know, where we need to be on the 10 year. Obviously, short term rates are too high, you know, in the long run. I mean, the funds rates at five and a quarter, five and a half, that's well above, I think, most people's estimate of fair value, equilibrium, R, and uh, that, uh, you know, that the R star is probably around two and a half percent ish. So the funds rate is currently a little more than double where I expect it to be in the long run. So I do expect the Fed, once inflation is within spitting distance of its, of its target, which I expect by this time next year, they'll be cutting interest rates slowly, you know, at first, but steadily. And then by mid-decade, they'll have the funds rate back to two and a half, the tenure at four, that's equilibrium. I'm sure we'll never get there or we'll only be there for a brief shining moment because again, these are markets and things happen, but that's kind of sort of where I think we're headed in the long run. So 
you know, the long-term rates are kind of sort of where they need to be, I think, long run. Short-term rates, not so much, obviously. And they'll rate themselves, but it'll take a little bit of time for that to happen. Well, I mean, 10-year yield at four, inflation at two. The real yield is two. And that, that I think that's where we're headed. And I think that's what the markets are generally saying, two. That's where we should be in the, in the on the long end. Short end, you know, two and a half minus two is 50 basis points. That kind of feels like, you know, roughly where it's been long run. So, you know, well, 50 basis point real yield on the short end, 200 basis point real yield on the long end on the 10 year. If you look at inflation expectations, they're 2%, two, two maybe on the CPI, they're probably closer. Most inflation expectations are based on CPI. They're probably two and a half percent. They're 50 basis points above core PCE. So I don't know. I think we're kind of there in terms of expectations already. The market is discounting a 2% real yield. Thank you for the question. It could be that one reason why treasury, I mean, excuse me, corporate spreads are as narrow as they are is that issuance has been, you know, somewhat depressed. But I'd say only somewhat. I mean, you know, obviously I am Moody, I'm, I work for Moody's and I look at the bond issuance data pretty carefully. And, you know, it's down, you know, but, you know, not inordinately so. So I'm not sure. Maybe on the margin, you know, that's the case. I think spreads are narrow because investors are generally sanguine about credit risk. You know, there's some risk out there that, you know, that may manifest itself again if the, if the rate structure stays where it is for any length of time, you know, more than a year or so, then as, you know, m- more corporates refinance, we'll see more credit problems. But barring that, you know, if things kind of stick roughly to script and the Fed starts easing policy by this time next year and the curve starts writing itself, you know, and there's no recession, which I, yeah, I don't expect, then, yeah, I think spreads are, they're, you know, they're narrow. I, they're, the market feel, the core bond market feels to me, again, a little overvalued relative to my measure of fair value, but, you know, not screamingly so. That's a good place to wrap this sort of space up. Mark, where can people find some of your work? Well, I'm at Mark Zandi. I'm on Twitter. It's, I guess, X. I do have a podcast. Thanks for mentioning that Inside Economics. And we do that every week and it's up there for folks. You got to be a little nerdy, but given this conversation, I think everyone on the call is probably a little nerdy. So you'll, I think you might enjoy that. And we also have a, a website called Economic View. It's a paid site, but there's a lot of stuff that goes up that's for free. A lot of stuff I write for free up on the site. So you feel free to, you know, take a look at that. It's called Economic View. And then, of course, you know, got, got if you really want to get to know our products and services, let me know. I'll have someone talk to you about that. Thank you, Bray, for joining. Thank you, Mark. Again, this will be a podcast. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Take care, everyone.